So how to speed this up? Since there are many calls that have the same argument passed, they end up duplicating the work over and over again. So we use a form of caching uh, called memoization. And this is the definition from Wikipedia. And computing memoization, now most computer people just call it caching the function. Uh, but memoization is the official term for it. It's an optimization technique used primarily to speed up computer programs by storing the results of expensive function calls and returning the cached result when some input, the same input occurs again. So here's some pseudocode. Uh, it, I wrote it kind of Python-like, uh, but it is uh, some of it is pseudocode uh, for doing this. So what for, you can do this for any function. Uh, it's especially useful for a function of one argument. That's what I show here. So you have a function of one argument. And so it, if this argument is stored in the cache as a key, so the cache is actually a dictionary it's going to use. And it start, this code starts out with an empty dictionary. So we'll show you that code. So if, uh, if A is in the cache, that means we've already called the function and we have its value. All we do is return that value. So we don't have to actually call the function. Uh, if it's not in the cache, we go ahead and calculate the value that we would, would, would we would return uh, before we started caching. And once we have the value, we store that value in the cache under the key that matches the argument. And then we return the value. So next time you call this function with that same argument, it's going to look it up here from when it calculated it before. So. Uh, now this technique really speeds up things. Uh, it still has a lot of overhead because it has to do all these function calls recursively even though it looks up the answer. You'll see it still gets kind of slow. Uh, so let's look at that one run. So here's the code for doing caching. It's a little different than the book. Uh, so first of all you use a list uh, to store the values that you've looked up and to create the cache instead of a dictionary and that's because you're actually looking up numbers. Anytime you're looking up numbers as the key uh, it may be better to use a list. It depends on the situation. So here's our recursive function uh, and because I'm creating the cache outside I don't pass the cache as one of the parameters. That's another change from the book. But basically you'll see here it's got that pseudocode. It gets down here and it eventually asks is the uh, cache at the change we're looking for not equal to none? So if that's true, there's already an existing value that we already solved for, in which case it just returns that value. So if it if it's uh, set to none, it's going to go down to this, uh, this else, and uh, it's going to do the uh, smaller problem i for this list that it creates for all the values of the change less than the change value just like in the original problem and it eventually finds the min coins and it just returns that and uh, but just before it returns it here it remembers what is the minimum coins so that's where it sets the cache uh, so that's it now I also time this you'll see it's very fast uh, but it still uses a lot of memory because it does make all the recursive calls it actually makes the recursive calls uh, and then if that already has a solution it returns that. So uh, we're going to see if there's an advantage. You can actually write this using dynamic programming a different way. So let's go ahead and run it. And you see it's it's so fast it can't time how many seconds to get the solution. So next we're going to look at dynamic programming. So even though this speeds up the technique, there's the overhead of all the extra function calls and the associated memory with that, uh, and the complexity of the code can be simpler. So dynamic programming, I, I have a link here to Yale which explains what it is. Uh, but in recursive solutions, we write code to go from a, a big problem and we, we try to then recurse and ask to solve a simpler problem. So we work from big down to small, eventually where we get so small in the problem that we can find the solution and then it starts returning those results eventually to the call that did the big problem. Uh, so sometimes this results in a lot of redundancy in the recursive steps. In dynamic programming, 
offers a better solution to some types of these problems. It starts with a simple problem and it builds on these simpler problems to solve the bigger ones. So it actually goes in the opposite direction. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a lookup table similar to the, the memoization technique, uh, but it does it by building a table of all the solutions up to the size of the problem we're solving. So basically if we're going to solve for 63 cents, we solve the problem for one cent, and then we solve the problem for two cents, and then three cents until we get up to 63 cents. Uh, it's kind of like the opposite uh, philosophy of recursion. I kind of mentioned that. Recursion works from the big problem toward the simpler problem and eventually the base case. Dynamic problem programming, we start with the base case and we solve every problem in complexity up till we get to the big problem, storing the solutions along the way to use them for each new bigger step. So let's see how this works. So we're going to have one table uh, that has each entry in the table will be the input so this is solving for six cents and so on. Uh, there seems to be an error in his thing here for because six replaced twice. I don't know, that should be a seven. At any rate, so in step one we solve for one cent and that one's easy. We just we know it's one penny because there's a coin value for that. In step two what we do is we say well we want to solve for two cents so we we want to say subtract a penny, subtract a nickel, subtract a dime. So we want to try all the coins. The only coin less than one cent is one cent. So we subtract one cent and we're left with solving for one cent and we just look that up because we've already solved that. And three cents, we subtract one cent and look up the solution for two cents, which is two. And that keeps going until we get to five cents. When we get to five cents, we have two coins to try. We can try one cent and five cent and five cent is in the list of coins so we just stick a one in here. So let's keep going and it's not going to get very interesting until we get to actually eleven. So when we get to eleven this shows you what happens. So here's the table and the table is going to be built all the way up to ten cents and ten cents was a dime so it's just one coin and so eleven cents we're going to try all these coins. We're going to try one cent, five cents, and ten cents. These are all coins less than eleven. And then we're going to find the minimum solution of those three. So all we have to do is look up the, the solution for eleven minus one, which is ten cents. And then look up the solution for eleven minus five, which is two cents. And then look up the solution for eleven minus uh, eleven minus ten, which is one cent. And you'll find those two solutions which have the minimum, which is one. And we just choose the uh, the first one. And that's it. Uh, we choose the first minimum uh, that we have and uh, so we get the minimum of the three things and we keep building the table that way. So let's look at the code and I'll have you mostly look at this in the book uh, but you can see the code is very short. So here's the, here's the actual method it passes a uh, coin value, so this is, those are the coins we're going to make change with, the amount of change we want to make, and then min coins will be your table that we're going to build. Uh, so this is the original code from the book. Uh, so when we want to call this, it doesn't show this in the book, but we have to create this table. So we create uh, uh, the amount we're solving for times uh, uh, and, uh, plus one and we make a list that long which is initialized to all zeros. And we're solving for 31 so we pass those two things and this is the array of coins so this is where we call it and then it just prints out the table here so you can see it's, it's it does all the solutions and I'll let you look at the code to see how it works. There's one other piece of code they have in the book they they modify this so that as they record each solution they have a parallel table uh, that keeps track of the actual value of the coin they chose. So you can follow that table backwards uh, to get a list of coins for any solution. So let me go ahead and run this. And you'll see it's got the, all the solutions from 1 up to 63. How many coins they take. 
And if you run the very final code in the book, it has two tables and you could print those out. It would have uh, how many coins it took to solve it for a certain value. And it, you could also list out the, uh, the coins.